Welcome to episode one of Major Stuff. I'm your host, Jay, and today we're talking about Led Zeppelin. Pretty major stuff. So Led Zeppelin, British rock band from 1968. They've been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They have a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and they're credited as the 14th greatest artist of all time, with piles and piles of achievements on top of that. Well, let's go back to where it all started to see how we got to this point. So before we talk about Led Zeppelin, we have to talk about the Yardbirds, which was formed by Paul Samuel Smith, the bassist and the producer of the Yardbirds. Alongside Paul Samuel Smith, you had Keith Relf, Jim McCarty, Chris Dreja, and Top Topham. Most of these guys won't be very important for the rest of the story, but they were there. So in late 1963, Topham was replaced by a then relatively unknown Eric Clapton, who eventually later in his career went on to join Cream, making the song Sunshine of Your Love, White Room, and Crossroads all in the top 30 of the Billboard charts. But that's later, and we're not here to talk about Eric Clapton. So fast forward to 1964, where we meet Jimmy Page, the main character of the first part of our story. He was approached by the Yardbirds about possibly replacing Eric Clapton, but Jimmy was one of Eric Clapton's good friends, so he declined, not wanting to take his friend's job. Uh, But Eric Clapton quit the very next year, uh, which he, of course, recommended his friend, Jimmy Page, again. Um, But he declined again because his job was going pretty good and his health he had some like health issues so he didn't want to he didn't know if he could tour really and so he recommends his buddy Jeff Beck so Jeff Beck plays with them for about a year at this point and uh, then off in a different neighborhood in the UK Jeff goes to a recording studio with you guys and So Jimmy Page hears this song that Jeff recorded and comes up with the idea of forming a massive supergroup of the best musicians all together playing in one band. And he landed on Jeff Beck for the guitarist, uh, the bassist and drummers from The Who. But the main issue was they didn't really have anyone on vocals. And that, combined with some other contract stuff, that really kind of stopped it from the idea of getting off the ground. Which, in the words of John Entwistle, which was the drummer from The Who, in within that conversation, the proceedings would take to the air like a lead balloon. Because he didn't really see success in the group's future. A few weeks later... Our boy Jimmy Page goes to a Yardbird show that he regularly did because his friends all played in it. Um, Heads backstage where the bassist for the Yardbirds tells Jimmy that he's leaving the band. Now, the bassist was also the producer from before, Paul Samuel Smith. Well, he tells Jimmy that he's leaving the band, and Page offered to finally replace him and join the Yardbirds, so everyone was stoked. Just third time's a charm. Eventually, Jimmy switches to lead guitar from bass with Jeff Beck, so they have like a dual lead guitar lineup. However, uh, since there was kind of like a lack of commercial success, it uh, led to issues within the band because nobody was really making much money. So then Jeff Beck leaves, and now a Beckless Yardbirds make one more album, and then Keith and Jim leave after that, leaving only Jimmy Page and Chris Straja. But this breakup gave Jimmy Page an opportunity to create a new sort of collage of sound, as he called it, which featured a Mellotron, which is like an electric piano that the Beatles used in Strawberry Fields Forever, and later turned into like a staple in progressive rock bands like Genesis, where you get like that main Genesis sound. But anyways, Jimmy's creating this new collective sound, uh, considering a bunch of people for different roles within the band, since it's just the two guys. Uh, And he lands on this dude, Terry Reed. He's real young, like 19-year-old vocalist. 
but Terry had just signed a solo deal to, you know, come out as a solo artist instead. And it was like he had to balance between a solo contract that he just signed or a experimental band with not really a whole lot of commercial success and like what are you going to do if you're 19, right? So he declines, obviously, but not before he recommends his then unknown friend named Robert Plant, who he said looked like a Greek god. So they bring in Robert Plant, and uh, they got this new guy to sing for them, and Robert Plant recommends his childhood friend John Bonham on the drums. So this new group starts to take shape. Uh, you know, they got the four guys all together. Every position's filled. They're good to go. But then Chris Dreja decides to leave the band to focus on being a photographer and ends up actually taking a picture of like one of the first, like, most popular pictures of the new Yardbirds. Now, Jimmy was a session guitarist before all of this. So, uh, and he used to work with a bunch of people also, you know, in the session guitar world. And uh, once Chris left, then he was approached by one of his old guys that he used to work with named John Paul Jones. And uh, he gets along great with everybody. He already has chemistry with Jimmy, and it works out great. They practice together for about a month or so, and the new quartet of Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, John Bonham and John Paul Jones form the new Yardbirds. So they start touring and they're bouncing this new sound of old Yardbird songs with new Yardbird songs all performed together because they could play both really Um, but it kind of had a weird feel because they were aiming for the new sound but they had more old songs to play which were played different live already. So it's it was this weird mix mash of old Yardbirds and new Yardbirds. So this goes on, and we get to 1968. They get in- introduced as the Yardbirds in some places, the new Yardbirds in other places. Promotional materials have one name or the other name. It, it, stuff doesn't really match up as much, and it just kind of gets confusing. Um, So they announced the last ever Yardbirds experience. Um, But at the same time, uh, this could have been because Chris Straja actually owned the rights to the Yardbirds still. And so he had sent a cease and desist order. (laughs) So (laughs) hard to perform with a name you're not allowed to use. So they got to come up with a new name. And Jimmy Page remembers that old conversation back in 1966 with the members of The Who about if he made this, you know, this super group, it would go down like a lead balloon. Uh, Which then they landed on the name we all know now as Led Zeppelin. Uh, Initially, it was L-E-A-D, but they figured Americans wouldn't get it right and they would keep calling him lead zeppelin so they drop the a and just keep it led zeppelin and a lead balloon going down isn't as impressive and so what would be the biggest lead balloon which is how they ended up replacing balloon with zeppelin with the influence of the 1937 hindenburg burning that like most iconic picture of led zeppelin on their album where it's the giant you know, Hindenburg Zeppelin burning and crashing. So now a month later, they started playing together. They recorded their debut album, Led Zeppelin. It was recorded and mixed in like nine days. And they only logged about 30 hours in the studio, which Jimmy Page ended up just paying himself. And just in those 30 hours of recording and editing, they were able to knock out this nine track album including some of the most recognized songs in rock history. Like it, it has Good Times, Bad Times, which can usually be recognized from just the first two notes. 
uh, dazed and confused communication breakdown which is my personal favorite from the album and almost i think one of my personal favorite led zeppelin songs of all time which even since their release have been added to like best of albums and i mean classic rock best like top tracks of all time for every list that comes out you'll probably find one of those songs if not all three of them but just as they were kind of getting all of this together they got the name they got the songs it's you know they're busting their ass trying to make this all mash together and sound awesome um they get uh, word that frau von zeppelin uh, descendant of the Zeppelin aircraft's creator had a huge issue with the name for obvious reasons because you know um, and uh, but as a gesture of goodwill they met with Frau pretty cordially at a TV studio and uh, she decided they were good guy you know she she liked she liked what they were what they were about and all this stuff kind of changed changed her mind on the whole thing um, which was awesome, right? And, uh, but <laughs> just as, you know, she was cool with it, she was, you know, she didn't think that they were, you know, making her name look bad or anything. Uh, she's walking out of the studio of that same meeting and sees the cover of the Led Zeppelin debut album, which is the Hindenburg <laughs> Burning. <laughs> and immediately just loses her mind and the band members remember running from because she was just so angry and uh, that caused uh, Frau to threaten them with a lawsuit um, demanding them to change their name which they did actually just to appease her for one show they changed it to The Knobs um, which Weirdly enough, the change actually ended up helping the band as the incident gave them kind of like worldwide publicity about this huge, crazy situation, right? Um, and so the band released the list of names that they were kind of picking between, and a lot of them were kind of funny, you know, witty names, and uh, it was pretty widely received with that intent where everyone kind of see oh you know these are funny names it's this cool band that's playing go good music and they are willing to change their name to like the ned zeppelins or the knobs you know and it was accepted very well and made everyone like the band only more which made them or made the fans and critics all just prefer them to change it back to led zeppelin which kind of ended up putting the case aside and it made Frau's point to sue them kind of moot. So this Led Zeppelin debut album reached number six on the Billboard chart, which is huge, and was noted by like prominent music critics as a significant turning point in the evolution of hard rock and heavy metal. After the release of the debut album, their manager was even able to secure a deal with Atlantic Records just because they pumped out this awesome album and Atlantic Records was ready to make a deal. And they were, everyone in Led Zeppelin was, had been around the block for a little bit with contracts and stuff and kind of knew how to make it work and, uh, and knew what they wanted out of their contract. So at the time, it was the... It was actually the biggest deal of its kind for a new band. Not only that, but at the time where they were signing them, the record executives never even seen Led Zeppelin. Uh, they just kind of like did a blind sign. Uh, but it was not only that, being it, it was a weird deal and a massive, a massive contract of its kind. They got the money up front and uh, like a ton of ton of money for not ever seeing them but they also uh, in their deal got final say on 
when they would release albums, when they would tour, how they would tour, the designs of their albums, everything, designs for everything. They would even got the final decision on how to promote every release and the promotions that they would use, which is insane, um, especially then. So with this, with all this huge positive publicity towards his first album, they go on tour and in the U.S. So they're touring all over the U.S. and they don't really have a ton of time to really stop and make a second album album like stop touring so what do you do if you can't stop touring to make a new album you just make the new album while you tour Uh, so they go through just different recording studios along the way and start recording these new tracks and make up led zeppelin 2 which was an even bigger commercial success than their debut album and it's been even attributed as the musical starting point for heavy metal, which is funny because despite Robert Plant being this Greek god type of, you know, the global sex symbol guy, he was more deep down just like an AV nerd that liked Lord of the Rings, which great. We love that, right? Um, so... <laughs> And the second album itself included the song Ramble On, which the lyrics were heavily influenced by Lord of the Rings. And that wasn't the only song that, you know, paid homage to that. You have the Battle of Evermore. You have Misty Mountain Hop, uh, Brony R. Stomp, and even some of Stairway to Heaven, which is awesome. Like, find that now. It's pretty difficult. And just kind of unique for this genre at the time with, you know, this band and the way that they were formed and everything. Just kind of cool. Um, but anyways, this, uh, despite the massive success of this second album, uh, there weren't really many radio or TV stations geared towards rock music at the time in the UK. And on top of that, the band refused to release songs as singles. So it made it difficult for the radio to play their music, even the rock stations that did exist. Even if they did, the songs that they had made are all like six minutes or, you know, plus or five minutes or more, which generally weren't played on the radio anyways because of how long they were. But they also considered their albums to be a complete experience, which is why they preferred people to go to their live shows. Um, but despite this, some of the songs were still released in the U.S. without the band's consent, uh, namely an edited version of Whole Lot of Love, which was the title track of their second album. Um, and they even cut it from about five minutes to three minutes long to kind of satisfy the radio. Um, and it even ended up rising up to all the way to number four on the billboard chart selling over like a million copies but the band hated it because it was not only taking away uh, i mean they were releasing it as a single which they were super against but they even cut the song without their consent right this is all someone else is doing and then it just wasn't the quality that they wanted which they really cared about and because of all of these factors, they just they decided as a band that they would never listen to this edited version ever again. And like it would be it's banned in their presence. But touching on the sound quality issue and everything, they they did pre- prefer people to see the live show. And that's why they toured so much. Um, but th- they did actually appear on television one time in France to perform in 1969 just before that whole lot of love release or pre-release and uh, after hearing the recording and seeing the quality of it and everything because they weren't in charge of you know they had the show had its own sound engineer and they couldn't really adjust anything or make it sound better but they saw how terrible the sound quality was of this show 
and they were like we will never play on television ever again and they never did granted it was easier then because there's there was less television in you know 1969 but still so like i said before the second album was uh, i mean commercial blowout success it was awesome um so they took a break from that and jimmy page and robert plant decided to head to broniar which was a cottage in wales used as a holiday house by robert plant's family in the 50s um so they they head there to kind of get more familiar with each other you know figure out how each other works start you know writing music separately um and it really opened jimmy page's eyes and to robert plant and he really grew to know him much better for really the first time that he's ever had to you know they were bandmates this whole time and now they're like their roommates living together in a you know in a cottage and it because of this it created a new standard of you know the, the band traveling for inspiration which changed the direction of the band and they started writing their third album um, which showcased more of their versatility with you know more acoustic sound better range and just a uh, a positive growth within the band as a whole. However, critics of the band gave this new direction kind of a mixed reaction, which only, I mean, the band already didn't really like the music press before, but this increased it quite a bit because they they come up with this, you know, this big growth as a band together and just to kind of get shitty reviews from the music press. <laughs> but... If that already wasn't bad enough, you know, you you come up with this new awesome sound that you're really proud of and it gets kind of shot down. Um, Immigrant Song, the opening track of this third album that they've worked on, was also released as a single against the band's wishes, just like Whole Lot of Love. I'm like, damn, both albums, I'm like, damn. So we'll move on to 1971 in a second, but first a short ad from our sponsor where, yeah, oh, wow, yeah, okay. wow, okay, I just uh, got word that we actually have the CEO and founder of our sponsor here today to do the ad read. It's actually just, just me. Uh, it's my streaming service called Everything, where you can stream basically everything from any other streaming service uh, and all in one place and even request your own things that you want to watch if I don't happen to have it. It's $8 a month or a little bit cheaper if you sign up through my Patreon, which is linked with pretty much anything connected to this podcast. And you can get more information at geteverythinggood.com. That's geteverythinggood.com. And now back to Led Zeppelin. All right, so we've arrived to 1971. Uh, Led Zeppelin's success is at an all-time high. They're just killing it with everything they're doing. And because of this and all of the recent achievements from the band, they started wearing more elaborate and more flamboyant clothing, adding lasers and big light shows to their performances. But at the same time, this was when some of the most notorious stories and myths about the band started. Uh, including renting out like entire hotel rooms and just destroying them in massive parties. The uh, John Bonham riding a motorcycle through hotel hallways, throwing televisions out windows, the massive drug-filled orgies, one allegedly even involving a shark, which is one of the most controversial myths because of the different accounts of the same event. But... Uh, Following an interview from the manager who is involved in the act himself directly, dismissed some of the more ridiculous accounts of the event, but confirmed that it was a red snapper and not a shark, and it wasn't as graphic as it's been portrayed. They ended up destroying places so bad that they received lifetime bans from various hotels, including the Seattle Hotel with the shark incident. 
And with all these events going on and all this, the hotel destruction, the music press, just were going on and on about how Led Zeppelin was just all hype and how they weren't like good musicians. It was just all hype with the events that they were doing and everything like that. So in response to this criticism from the music press, uh, Led Zeppelin released their fourth album with no text, no art, just completely blank on all the sleeves, nothing, nothing to see at all. Um, but later, the record company that was making it said that they needed at least something to differentiate it because it's you can't just have a blank record in a factory of blank records. So they decided to put four symbols, which went on to being one of the best-selling albums in music history, which was now referenced as the Zoso album because the symbols on the album look to spell out the word Zoso. Now this Zoso album also included the song Stairway to Heaven, uh, one of the most well-recognized songs in their entire music repertoire. Uh, interestingly though, the first time they ever played Stairway to Heaven live, uh, it was booed by the audience in 1971. Uh, but despite this, the song has an estimated like 2.8 million radio plays in the United States, which if you played that back to back would equal about 44 years. It also became one of the most played songs in guitar shops across America from the insane guitar solos in the middle of the song being so long and such a popular song um, that led to the famous Wayne's World scene almost 20 years later where Wayne goes into a guitar store and attempts to play Stairway to Heaven and the store clerk stops him and points to a sign that states no Stairway to Heaven. This was due to the band denying the rights to even use the song during the movie. Stairway to Heaven also received notoriety from one of the biggest rock and roll myths to ever exist uh, where in 1982 a uh, televangelist claimed if you played the bustle in your head row segment of Stairway to Heaven backwards, you would hear subliminal satanic messages, which was pretty much immediately dismissed like much televangelist claims as ridiculous from the band and pretty much everyone. But it didn't stop everyone from giving that acclaim to uh, d hundreds of other songs that if you play backwards, it plays satanic messages since this album was so successful it was followed by two years of worldwide tours which concluded in 1973 when led zeppelin released their fifth album houses of the holy which introduced even more experimentation with synthesizers they followed the same theme with the, their last album by not printing their name or album title on the album sleeve um just a just a picture um and even with all this anti-advertising for their band the album still topped worldwide charts and the tour following the release broke records for attendance that was initially set by the beatles and since everything seemed to be working in the right direction for the band they decided to take a break from touring in 1974 to launch their own record label called swan song uh, which is when Led Zeppelin started using that uh, the angel Icarus picture as their logo for things, which can be seen on the millions and millions of Led Zeppelin shirts everywhere, where it's like the fallen angel design. But uh, even though Swan Song was mainly in place to promote their own albums, they eventually expanded the label and signed artists like Bad Company, The Pretty Things, and Maggie Bell. Uh, Swan Song later released the sixth album of Led Zeppelin called Physical Graffiti. Uh, and this album, Rolling Stone magazine, said that it was ba pretty much the only bands that Led Zeppelin had to compete with now for the title of world's best rock band were The Who and The Rolling Stones which, to be honest, at the time was not even a competition then. After the release of Physical Graffiti, 
every single previous Led Zeppelin album re-entered the top 200 album chart from people buying them again and being excited about the music. So they kind of trickled out and then immediately all jumped back into the top 200. Um, and then right after that, they ended up playing five sold-out shows in the largest arena in the UK. So now we get to 1975. Led Zeppelin is at pretty much the peak of their commercial success, or the the new peak, since they keep setting that standard over and over again. Um, They're just killing it. But uh, Robert Plant and his wife are badly injured in a car accident where Robert breaks his ankle. Led Zeppelin then canceled all their upcoming tours and took a hiatus for like two years until 1977. Uh, During this time, they wrote their next album, Presence. Uh, The sound was another change in direction for the band, and Robert Plant pretty much recorded the whole thing in a wheelchair. Uh, And because it's a different change in direction, it received more mixed reactions among fans and press um it was the same time that jimmy page started using heroin during recording sessions uh even though jimmy page denied it ever affecting his performance but i I mean come on um but rather than going on tour during this time since i mean they couldn't uh led zeppelin decided to make a concert film with accompanying soundtrack uh, called the song remains the same but nobody was really feeling it and it didn't get very good reviews but well, that's which is pretty much the case for for all concert movies i mean really name one good one so we get to 1977 led zeppelin decides it's time to go on tour again everyone's healthy and can perform uh, so they start a north american tour setting even more attendance records than they did before uh, which you would think it would generate a ton of money right Uh, record setting concerts so much success they're able to do all these things and it's just like back-to-back record sets over and over Um, but because of the record setting concerts that means the concert venues were totally full and since fans are psycho uh at this time 70 people were arrested as thousands of fans attempted to gate crash a venue for like two sold out nights um while other fans threw rocks through like glass doors to try to make their way inside so like everyone's trying to rush into this venue or, or venues as they're playing because they're just sold out and impossible to get into. But regardless, it's not really a good look, right? Um, More than that, uh, during a rain or shine show in Tampa, there was this huge thunderstorm. That's why they had to kind of guarantee a rain or shine because they were going to play either way. So there's this huge thunderstorm, and uh, they still played, but a huge riot breaks out. Um, following the riot, uh, John Bonham and other Led Zeppelin staff, uh, not band members, but just like staff members were arrested after they badly beat up a promoter during the band's performance. Uh, just, uh, it's like a downward spiral up until two days after this arrest, Uh, Robert Plant gets news that his five-year-old son dies from a stomach virus at home. Uh, They canceled the rest of the tour, leading people to really kind of wonder what was in store for the future of Led Zeppelin. You know, with all this bad stuff happening, do they just quit? Like, what? What's next? Um, So, which brings us to 1978. The following year, or I guess the end of the year where all of this stuff was happening, um, it was a very interesting time for Led Zeppelin with all these things happening, offstage turmoil, uh, you know, living like a rock star for a decade, always 
you know, isn't going to have amazing results, <laughs> especially when you're as big of a band as Led Zeppelin. Um, but just when you might think you know what would happen next or you think you could guess what would happen next, they throw another curveball and meet with none other than ABBA. Uh, yep. Uh, Dancing Queen ABBA. Well, Led Zeppelin actually recorded several songs on the In Through the Outdoor album that they were working on uh, in the ABBA Polar Studios, which all kind of happened in classic Led Zeppelin fashion with Benny and Bjorn of ABBA taking Robert Plant on a, like a night out to a sex club. Which is just wild, right? Uh, which, and but that that isn't the only thing that made this album interesting. Uh, it also included the song "All My Love," which was originally titled "The Hook," uh, which Robert Plant wrote in honor of his son, and uh, he ended up recording it all in a single take of like eight the eight the whole eight minute song, just one take and done. Um, and has since the song's been out has been described as like Led Zeppelin's saddest and most heartfelt song that they've ever made um, and not only that it was Robert Plant claimed it was one of the best I mean Led Zeppelin's finest moments uh, even though Jimmy Page and John Bonham didn't really care for the soft rock tone you know they can kind of appreciate the the purpose of the song right so this album comes out and uh it brings us to 1980 led zeppelin's on tour where at one show about halfway through uh john bonham the drummer uh collapsed on stage and was just rushed to the hospital it was probably due to drugs it's i mean most it's it's drugs um and, and alcohol honestly um, the band claimed it was just like from overeating, but come on, come on. A uh, couple months later, while being like while John Bonham was being driven to rehearsals, though, uh, he was picked up by the Led Zeppelin assistant. Uh, Bonham asked to stop for breakfast, and he has four quadruple vodkas, which if you don't know, would be about 24 ounces of vodka. <laughs> uh, then continued to drink <laughs> once they arrived to the studio after that. I mean, started drinking pretty, pretty heavily again. Um, they ended the rehearsals pretty late in the night, like normal. Everyone goes to Jimmy Page's house where they, you know, they all fall asleep. The following day, John Paul Jones and the tour manager find John Bonham dead. Uh, cause of death appeared to be from choking on his own vomit and asleep. But in the in the previous 24 hours, he consumed about 40 shots of 40% vodka. Uh, John Bonham was also on a medication for anxiety at the time, but it's unknown if that really had any factor in his death because, it, you know, there's so much alcohol, it probably drowned it out. And rather than replace Bonham, Led Zeppelin decides to close the chapter on the band and stop playing altogether. And because it would just never be the same. They, I mean, they, they started Led Zeppelin with these four guys, and without one of them there, it's just it's not it's not the same Led Zeppelin. Um, the following decades after this, the members pursued their you know like their own projects where you can like. You can go and listen to Robert Plant's music or, uh, you know, there's there's the Honey Drippers, Page and Plant, you know, you get it. Which honestly led to a almost overdue induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995. And uh, coincidentally, uh, in 2005, one of the most interesting and kind of like odd happenstances happened where during a radio poll, uh, they aimed to create Rock's ultimate supergroup, 
from in 2005. So every musician that's ever lived, they they pulled a, a ton of people, and they were trying to get you know one musician per instrument to create this perfect you know master rock band, and uh, it ended up just being all four members of Led Zeppelin. If that, I mean, if that isn't the rock's ultimate supergroup, then, you know. While this was happening, though, uh, you might have noticed, might not have noticed, but up until 2013, uh, you couldn't find any Led Zeppelin songs on Spotify or iTunes or anything like that, um, which was mostly in part to uh, the band itself telling them that the quality that like iTunes offered or Spotify offered was just too low and didn't meet their standards, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> they just had set levels that they wanted you know their music to be performed and listened at and they just couldn't offer it at the time but uh, in 2013 they finally allowed their music to be played and streamed like that um once they were working on kind of the remastered editions where which he was doing at the very same time so it's like as they're telling like spotify and itunes that their quality isn't good enough to play their music um they're improving the quality of their own music at the same time so it's like how can you catch up <laughs> um but at a certain point it's like you know playing an 8k movie versus a 4k movie like what do you what, are you really gonna know really like maybe if you had like insanely high-end you know headphones to hear the sound crystal clear exactly how it's intended but probably ninety, you know, five percent of headphones, it's gonna sound the same, <laughs> you know. But that brings us to the, you know, the end of the Led Zeppelin story. They, you know, ended the band in nineteen eighty, and now get to pretty much just enjoy sitting on their throne of being one of the greatest rock bands of all time. And if that isn't some major stuff, then I don't know what is. Join me again next time for some more major stuff, and I'll see you then. Oh, wait, I guess here, the event, the podcast, shit.